بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا I've been given the thumbs up so inshallah we can begin السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أبرون جزاكم الله خير for uh, inviting uh, men uh, to this uh, blessed masjid and this blessed community جزاكم uh, الله خير for coming and taking the uh, last remaining few hours of uh, the weekend uh, to join what is um, a very important topic. I'm not saying that because I'm paid by men to say it, but uh, genuinely it's uh, one of the challenges of our time to discuss this issue of Islamophobia. And um, I request that um, uh, everyone, inshallah, kind of gives me an attentive ear. Uh, we'll try to kind of give this uh, some interaction as well so that people feel engaged and uh, part of this presentation. Uh, so to begin, uh, let me just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Abdullah Saif, and um, I am the community organizer for MEND, which stands for the Muslim Engagement and Development. Muslim Engagement and Development. Um, I, um, it's the first time for me to kind of present in this masjid, um, but uh, I'm no stranger to this masjid, and, and I know the brothers who helped establish it, mashallah. Very lively community, alhamdulillah. Um, <clears throat> part of my role in MEND, is to go across Masajid and the Muslim community in the Midlands and Wales region, which is the patch that I uh, look after, and um, to engage with them and to, uh, and to empower them. And that is actually the goal of men, to empower the Muslim community, primarily to engage and to be active in the uh, arenas of politics and media. Because uh, it's found that these two arenas are arenas of change in this society and in this community. And so if you want something to happen, um, if you're able to kind of get involved or engage or actively participate in these two arenas, uh, more often than not, something will happen. It is the, uh, uh, it is the equivalent of sihr in the time of Musa alayhi uh, salam. If you wanted to get anywhere, if you, if you knew the, the language and the, and the currency of the day, which is magic of his time, uh, you were able to and, and shift things. And today, the, the sihr of our time is uh, the, the illusions that the media put out and uh, you need that political tongue sometimes to, to be able to kind of maneuver and protect yourself and your community. Um, so today's presentation is entitled Islamophobia Causes and Cures. And uh, what we're going to do inshallah in today's presentation is, is primarily cover uh, four uh, areas. Um, this presentation inshallah will take about 40 minutes max inshallah. Uh, I'll try to be quicker than that. Um, and I want to make it clear that what we're going to cover today can be distressing to some people. We're going to be talking about attacks. We're going to be talking about uh, harm that's happened to the Muslim community uh, and even murders, um, unfortunately. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. And if anyone just have any questions or feels like they want to kind of interject and say, or make a comment or anything like that, feel free to kind of put your hand up, inshallah. Um, and I'll try to answer it if it doesn't kind of prolong things even, even more. Otherwise, inshallah, after we'll have a chance to, to have a conversation. So firstly, we'll talk about definitions uh, of Islamophobia. Then we'll talk about uh, what the causes are, uh, and then uh, cures of Islamophobia. This talk is Islamophobic causes and cures. And then we'll talk about some of the uh, successful change that um, in men's lifetime we've able to kind of see uh, happen. So uh, first and foremost, let's move to the issue of definition. Now, you know, those of you who kind of perhaps studied um, Usul or anything like this. There's a maxim which says, uh, like you can't really make a comment on anything unless you can define it. You can't really challenge a concept until you define it. And so the issue we have before us is, and this is an issue, is defining Islamophobia. Um, here, what we have before us is a definition which is uh, presented by the Fear Inc. Corporation in America. It's a definition which, uh, let's just read it. Uh, it defines Islamophobia as an exaggerated, irrational fear, hatred, and hostility towards Islam and Muslims, perpetuated by negative uh, stereotypes, resulting in bias, discrimination, mar marginalization of Muslims from civic, social, and political life. What we will find about this particular definition is helpful because it tells you what Islamophobia is. So it's an exaggerated, irrational fear. That's usually what phobia means. Um, but it's a hatred towards Islam and Muslims. How is it um, manifested? It's uh, by, uh, perpetuated by negative stereotypes, resulting in bias, discrimination, and marginalization. Marginal, marginal, Let me get my tongue in order. Uh, and who does it impact? 
uh, obviously Muslims from uh, civic, societal, uh, social and political life. So this is quite a holistic definition, but it's not the definition that particularly works in the UK. That's an American one. There's been a big challenge within the UK to try to kind of get a definition. And the all-party parliamentary group, the APPG on British Muslims, so within parliament, there are APPGs on a variety of topics, from fox hunting to hajj to British Muslims. And it's a collection of politicians. They come together and discuss issues on that particular topic. So this one on British Muslims uh, came up with the task of defining Islamophobia. And they went through in many iterations. And they came up with this one here. I just want to use the laser. There you go. Um, Islamophobia, it says, is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expression of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. So this is a definition which perhaps is slightly different to the first one. Um, but there's, there's some key terms in there about racism, uh, couched in racism, expressions of Muslimness. And these are all selective terms, terms which after iterations and iterations of, of, uh, of definitions or potentials, it was settled on this. And we'll talk a bit about why it's couched in that kind of language further on. MEND itself supports this definition and it has explanatory notes and it's a, a very thick booklet uh, which they devised the policy department called More Than Words uh, which uh, kind of looks at uh, this particular definition and what it, effectively what it's also the foundations of why this term came about so you know the policy team in MEND really did some incredible work on this one and what's important to say is that this definition that we go back to, this one up here, has actually been accepted by the majority of, part, uh, of, of the political parties, uh, with the exception of the Conservative Party, more specifically the England and Wales Conservative Party. So in Scotland, the Conservative Party have accepted it. Um, and uh, so what Mendy is doing is pushing it out there to councils and local councils to try and adopt this definition. Um, and so this is part of our, uh, our challenge. Now, while we talk about the, having talked about the definition, we want to kind of see now what is it that is Islamophobia. I mean, if I would just put it out there to you, what kind of, how does, how does Islamophobia manifest? Can you give me any examples? So, some verbal, you know, in, in a verbal way, how else? Because of your dress, people uh, attack you for that, you know? Okay, how, how was, sorry? The way they look at you, okay? You get, you get these vibes, huh? you, can, you can sense there's something. How else does Islamophobia manifest? People treat you differently because you're... Yeah, okay, and the brother at the back? Yeah, verbal and physical attacks, absolutely. So, we've got this iceberg analogy that we use, and primarily what people see, is the top half here, uh, like with any iceberg, you see the tip of it. And what people see in the manifestation of Islamophobia is usually the verbal attacks, the curses, the, the, the curse words that they say, and the physical attacks that we've seen uh, happen. And that's a broad range of physical attacks. We're talking from people being pushed over, spat at, to murders. Uh, but like any iceberg, there's a structure to it. What's beneath the surface is a lot more damaging. And usually what's under the surface is what structurally kind of allows the manifestation above the, the, the surface to be seen. And so what we see here uh, are things like um, discrimination. Uh, we see these stereotypes and profiling that happens. We see uh, exclusion. So we're not put in certain spaces where conversations are happening to kind of better society. We're excluded from it. Or marginalization where it's very selective who it is that's kind of coming in. But predominantly the community is put uh, to the wayside. And so this is what people don't see, as it says here, and this is what people see. So there's, there's some foundational issue that has to kind of be addressed. And so when we talk about Islamophobia, we're talking about all of this. And that's part of the challenge. The challenge is how we address all these things. Primarily by, if we focus only on these, all we're doing is taking a step back, because then another one's gonna happen. And the challenge really comes in addressing these deeper issues these deeper, deeper issues. Yes? Their objections, um, it's quite varied. They, they, they still think, so with the Conservative Party, unfortunately what's happened is they had, 
there was a there was an issue with them against uh, on the issue of Islamophobia within their own party, and there was an independent inquiry done, which uh, many conservative MPs themselves felt was whitewashed, and it basically just kind of gave them a rap on the neck, uh, on the on the on the wrist or on the knuckles, saying you got no issues. And so, for them, they're saying that this definition, uh, the problem is Islam isn't a race. So why are you using the word race? Um, Islam, you know, Muslims, and this is unfortunately what we've heard previously from the BNP and all those parties where they will attack you and you know they will say, but Islam isn't a race. So, uh, and we'll talk about legal protections and things like this between race and religious discrimination as well. But it's primarily on those lines. But unfortunately, those who are really pushing against the narrative or the definition are people who have fortunately found or, or, or we see have got uh, quite a, a rich history of Islamophobia. Um, so whatever example or whatever kind of excuse is given by not just the Tory party but others as well is usually because it's couched in some, um, some issue that they already have. Now what we see is like I said this variety of things. Um, we see in the media issues like this. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to kind of look at these headlines. Yeah. This is a collage of headlines that have uh, appeared in tabloid press, in the media. Um, all showing, obviously, Muslims in a negative light, in negative language. And all this does is reinforce and perpetuates hatred and violence towards this community. Um, and see, what happens is you start getting things like uh, attacks happening on uh, uh, you know, graffiti, like here. You get... Um, you know, marches that start happening, uh, you still get um, attacks on graves, you get arson attacks on masajid, and you have obviously attacks that, um, and we'll talk about this a bit later, where uh, Muslims are killed, unfortunately. So you have this, this kind of issue where it's not just graffiti, it's not just arson attacks, bottles being thrown, pig's heads being left at masajid, but also people being well, killed. Um, and so people start to think, this is problematic. People start to think, that's my mosque, this is my local area, why has it become unsafe? What's happening here? Many of us perhaps are thinking, why is it that we're talking about Islamophobia? I've, uh, I've had a cushy, you know, uh, life, it's, uh, it's a nice area, middle class, there's no issues, we haven't faced anything. But we, we're here because we actually know that there is an issue. And what we find is, not only is it that there's this vandalism that takes place and this harm, you see that bullying also takes place. So what you have here from, the, um, from June 2017, um, Childline recorded a 69% increase in racist bullying in playgrounds, with the most common terms being bomber and terrorists. And that's only kind of being targeted at the Muslim community or Muslim children. So it's happening even within schools. Um, children themselves are kind of like picking up on these terms and associating with, with, with Muslim children. We see the discrimination taking place in the workplace, where Islamophobia is often hidden in plain sight. And it's not always, like I said, physical. So here, um, some of you may have come across this where someone did some research to kind of see where, what the real state of play is. And so they sent two CVs, exactly the same, same address, same everything, except the names. And so they found that people submitting CVs with Muslim sounding names uh, are three times less likely to get job interviews. And so you, um, you start to get um, a breakdown of some of the attacks that have happened. These are hate crimes in England and Wales between uh, 2020 and 2021. The bulk of them clearly are Muslim uh, uh, hate crimes that have come up. So, you know, we make up almost half the amount of attacks um, that have a religious discrimination element are on the Muslim community. These are just, this is all I'm giving you is the state of play. This is what the situation is on the ground. Um, and you get situations of Islamophobic, uh, institutional Islamophobia, and this is just one example in terms of schools where, for example, during um, uh, about a, a year or two ago, there was um, another incursion in Gaza, and the whole uh, Palestine uh, situation flared up. And we probably saw that a lot of school children started to kind of become emblazoned, emboldened, and they, they started going to school uh, wearing uh, you know, bracelets for Philistine or badges or things like this. And you get instances where students are being told that the display of Palestinian flags equates to terrorism. Yeah? Yeah. Um, where you get uh, you know, teachers telling students Palestine doesn't matter, and then using racial slurs. So this, this is what's happening. This is where, um, and this is just one example in schools. But then it becomes a bit more severe. 
we've got a few cases here where we find, um, and this is at the hard end of it, where, for example, in Leicester in 2017, a sister called Zainab Hussein was uh, going to school, and um, she was taking her two daughters to, to, to school, and uh, as she's walking on the pavement, uh, this guy, Paul Moore, he uh, woke up with the intention of killing a Muslim. He woke up with the intention, I'm going to go out and I'm going to kill a Muslim. So he's driving in his car and he sees Zainab Hussein and her daughters. And as they're walking, he drives from behind at speed and knocks straight into Zainab. He doesn't hurt the daughters. Oh, they weren't hurt as bad. But she was knocked onto the ground. He then continues and he finds two other schoolgirls and he tries to run them over, but they alhamdulillah managed to evade him. He hasn't finished yet. He turns around. And he comes back on the same road and he sees Zainab Hussain still on the floor and he drives over her again. And then Sister Zainab, her, her legs in a, can you see that frame there, in that, in that cast? So she's, um, Alhamdulillah, she's, yes brother. So, so uh, on the first point, the Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim women are, uh, without a doubt, the biggest victims of Islamophobia, especially the physical attacks, uh, because they're visible, they can be seen from a distance. Um, and um, and it's, it's something to kind of be considered um, regarding, you know, chaperones or kind of being there for, uh, with the sisters. But sometimes you're in, you know, you're, you're going to school, dropping your kids off. Like there's no, and everything before that has been fine, no issues. You've got no need for any chaperone or any, anything like that. It's a perfectly, it's predominantly Muslim area. Where, you know what I mean? Everything's safe. But then you get people like this. And so he, uh, he, he this man here, and alhamdulillah men were able to bring, uh, this is a, her husband who, uh, who thanked the work of uh, everyone involved and, and men for bringing uh, justice to uh, his family and making sure her story was heard. We have something closer to home. This is Uncle Muhammad Salim, rahimahullah, who died in 2013. Uh, he had prayed Salat al-Isha in Green Lane Masjid and he was on his way home when this man here, uh, Pablo Lapshin, who came from, uh, I think he was, I'm, I'm not sure, from Eastern Europe somewhere. He came and he stabbed him three times until he died. Rahimahullah. Shaheed, inshallah. And this man, he had already, I don't know if you remember, this was in 2013, and he had left um, homemade bombs in uh, Masjid Aisha, I think in Warsaw, in a mosque in Tipton, and in another Masjid in Wolverhampton. They're all small, but it was the same person, and he's, when, they, when, when they, they, they found the body of Muhammad Salim, um, they found it, it was, it was, he, it was this person who, um, who committed these atrocities and killed him, and he was uh, sentenced for life, uh, serving a minimum of 40 years. Um, you have the likes of Muhsin Ahmed, an elderly Yemeni man from Rochdale, who, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, um, killed by um, these two men here. Um, uh, Dale Jones and Damien Hunt, as he was walking to the masjid. And finally, you have Makram Ali. And this was an incident that happened in 2017 when people were having prayed Salat al Taraweeh in uh, outside the uh, Muslim Alpha House Mosque on Seven Sisters Road in London. They're all leaving, and Darren Osborne, this guy here, he took his van, had driven all the way from Wales, all the way to London, with the sole intention of uh, killing Muslims. And he drove through a crowd and he killed uh, Makram Ali. Rahimahullah. And when he was arrested and sentenced, and when he was in court, they told him, you know, he told them basically, the reason why I did this was because of all the media I was hearing about Muslims. He himself said, this basically radicalized him. And the worst of it, obviously, is what happened in Christchurch. And this is an incident that was, that everyone is aware of. Everyone kind of almost remember what happened when they woke up that morning and they, and they heard the news of, um, uh, uh, Brenton Tarrant, who went into two masajid and killed people on the day of Jum'ah. 51 people were killed. The variety, you have Mu'ad Ibrahim, three years old, 
you had uh, Haji Dawood, Nabi 71, Sister Linda uh, Armstrong and Reba's sister, and this young Sayyid um, uh, here as well, this 14 uh, year old boy. So, what you find is, you know, these people and their motives are very, you know, uh, extreme clearly. And, you know, he's, he wrote his own manifesto, 74 page manifesto, and he said, he called it the Great Replacement. And he's saying that he wanted to attack Muslims. And for the first time in, in New Zealand history, um, he was sentenced to life without parole. Um, it's never been given. But all these victims were law-abiding citizens. They were waiting in the masjid for Salat al-Jum'ah. And then you have instances like this. So we've had a kind of look at some of the uh, definitions. When it comes to what causes Islamophobia, what do you think plays... Just throw out a few things that you think has led to Islamophobia or the rise of Islamophobia in, uh, in society. So a lack of understanding of what Islam is, okay. Media. Okay, so media and entertainment basically, yeah. Uh, yeah, the back. Spreading false information about Islam and Muslims. Okay. Politics. Okay, these, these are all uh, uh, valid and, and effectively correct. Um, to adjust the first thing, media negativity. This is... Um, this looks at how Islamophobia is perpetuated in the media and how the media kind of uh, portrays Islam and Muslims in a negative light. So there was some research done in 2013 where they looked at uh, media articles where Muslims or Islam was mentioned. And these researchers, uh, Paul Baker and uh, here, these, these, three, these three researchers here, they found that out of 22 articles written on Muslims, one of them was moderate, not positive, just moderate, and 21 were negative. 21 negative one positive so when the Joe public is reading about Islam and Muslims the barrage of information they're getting is these guys are a problem these guys are problematic these guys are, are, are an issue like, just, just imagine that you have 21 people or 22 people in the room one person saying no he's okay and everyone else saying these are bad like, you, you kind of know where you're going with this in fact, I saw this one research done on, uh, on how uh, your perception changes even though you can see what the truth is just by the fact that other people around you are saying the wrong thing. There was a panel of four people or five, five people and there was one person who wasn't in on this study and so they had, all these five people had to look at this sheet of paper and this sheet of paper had two lines. One was clearly shorter than the other. One was clearly shorter than the other. And so the presenter asks everyone on the panel, which one's shorter? And so each one on the panel chooses the longer one, except for the test subject. She says, no, the smallest one. And she's looking at them thinking, can't you see what I see? And then they do it again, and a circle and a bigger circle. And she ends up looking at them and going against her own logic. She can see one circle smaller than the other, but because everyone else was saying, no, the smaller one, the bigger one's the smaller one, she went with them. And so this just kind of like feeds into what is uh, just human psychology, peer pressure, that society is saying all these things. They must be right. And so what happens is you get instances like this where you get uh, articles. So the Times is the world's most recognized newspaper. The Times is the world's most recognized newspaper. And this is a front page by a man called Andrew Norfolk who is no stranger to writing uh, bad articles about Muslims. So, Christian child forced into Muslim foster care. My God. <laughs> what a miskin Christian child. What's going on here? And then, lady in niqab and, you know, this blonde haired girl kind of being blurred. You know, it's like all these kind of things just layered on top of each other. So, this organization called Unmasked, which is part of the hacked off um, uh, media monitoring group. They said, let's look into this. And so this story basically says that uh, this child was forced into this Muslim uh, foster, care, uh, foster family. They ripped off her, uh, her, her, her cross necklace, her necklace and, uh, and they put it away and they, they forced her to uh, eat halal food. And they did 
all these kind of shenanigans. When they looked into it, and they found that this was far from the case, that this was a Muslim family that had taken on many Christian children, and all they did to the girl was they said, she was a young girl, they said, we can look after it for you, this necklace of yours. Yeah? And they were very, very hospitable, very kind, very loving, but that's not what you get from this. And this is the Times, and this is the front page, and these are the images. And this guy, the same guy, Andrew Norfolk, he's done three articles, each one with this, this bombastic kind of story about Islam and Muslims. And again, the, the, these, they, they found that in each article, he was just, there was no journalistic integrity, no standards for finding out the truth. It was just a case of, let's attack. That's our premise, that's our end goal. How do we get there? And so they manipulated the story to make it uh, uh, the case. Now, because of this media narrative, you get this start, you start to kind of, you hear so much about Islam and Muslims. You're buying the Sun newspaper, these tabloid papers, all over the country. Some places where there aren't Muslims, or very little Muslims. And so when you see this article, always talking about Islam and Muslim, 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 these guys are bad. You're thinking, how many of them are there? So Comrades, which is one of these like YouGov poll companies, uh, research companies, they, they asked people, and they said, what proportion of the UK is actually Muslim? Or, or sorry, do you think is Muslim? And so they had a number of um, suggestions, and one of them says, uh, uh, asked about the uh, who thinks it's more than 20%. Okay, so in London, oh, Okay, uh, yeah, we'll do that later actually. Um, so 35% of people thought that mu Muslims made up over 20% of London. In the West Midlands, people thought 40%. They're clearly off, you know what I mean? <laughs> Remember, West Midlands isn't just Birmingham, all right? It's a wider area as well. Then in the Northwest, they thought 40%, um, were well, over 20%. Um, in uh, Wales, 46%, I don't know where they got that from. And 38% in Scotland. Now, a little quiz. What is the actual number? So, in, what, in London, what percentage of Muslims, or what percentage of London are Muslim? Anyone care to guess? How much? 15? 5 0? <laughs> 10? Uh, 10? Yeah. So, uh, in London, it's like 12.4%. Um, West Midlands? Sorry? 15. Remember, West Midlands isn't just Birmingham. If I ask for Birmingham, I'm expecting at least double, you know. <laughs> yeah. West Midlands, what do you think? 20. 6.7%. Okay. In, well, Northwest is 5.1. Uh, how about in Wales? Remember, people thought 46% thought it was over 20%. Sorry? 2%. It's 1.5. And in Scotland? Yeah, pretty much 1.5 1, 1 again. So that's the reality. And, you know, this is kind of the perception. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know where they got these figures from, but it's clearly a blown up kind of number, isn't it? Now, one of the issues we said is the media. Another issue is lack of legislative protection. The law itself isn't strong enough to deal with the issue of Islamophobia and race discrimination, or uh, religious discrimination in any case. I'll just let the brother take a photo. You see, the Race and um, uh, Religion Act of 2006, um, it created um, two separate offenses, which is stirring up religious hatred and race, racial hatred. And what we find is that the threshold for establishing uh, racial hatred is a lot easier and a lot lower than the than it is to establish religious discrimination or hatred. With for racial hatred, you do not have to prove intent. You don't have to prove intention to be caught under the race uh, 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 as an offence for being racially discriminatory. Uh, discriminatory. The fact that you insult, abuse, use violence or threats against someone on the basis of their race is enough to be prosecuted under this. If you have the intention as well, obviously that's also court. Whereas with religion, you the only thing, what you have to do is you have to prove intent. Someone might 
insult you based on your religion, might abuse you based on your religion, might use threatening language. But that won't catch you under this, under this, this act. You might catch them under another act, you might be creating another kind of offense. But under this particular act, you won't get that. And what's frustrating is when you see a case like this. See, this guy here, he's called Eric Kitson. He used to be, a, remember UKIP, but they're still around. He used to be a counselor for UKIP. And he brought up this image, yeah? I don't know if you can see it. So it's a pig, Astaghfirullah al with a, with a chef hat on, and says, Lafdul Jalala there. And it's got a Muslim being spit roasted on a flame that's being emblazoned by the Quran. Like, I don't know how many other things you can kind of like put into a picture, yeah? The question is, is what this Eric guy stated, is it insulting? Is it abusive? Is he inciting violence through threat and inflammatory language? What do you think? Is it? Yes. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Quite clear. Uh, there's also, you can't see it in this post, but here, some of his comments where he even said, uh, Muslim women, uh, un-Muslim women, he said, hang them all and then ask questions later. This guy, a, a counsellor in one of the UK councils. See, his case was taken to court and the Crown Prosecution Service, they ruled that his words were merely deemed to be insulting, abusive, uh, but not threatening enough to stir up religious hatred. They ruled that whilst his words might be insulting, might be abusive, probably threatening, they couldn't prove his intention. They couldn't prove his intention. So what you find is that in the 15, 16 years that this Racing Religion, uh, religion Act 2006 was uh, enacted, only six cases have been brought before the, before the court under religious discrimination because it's so hard to meet the standard. Only six cases. Whereas how much discrimination has happened on the grounds of, uh, of religion? So many. But because the standard is so high, and the bar is so high, it's very difficult to, to get to. So you've got the media, you've got the law itself that needs changing. You've got all these structural issues as well. So for example, when it comes to media representation, the Muslims, or Muslim journalists make up 0.4% of all journalists in the UK. And some of them are quite famous, so you know some of them like Faisal Islam, who's now for the BBC. Farina Alam, she's, uh, she was with uh, uh, Bud, BuzzFeed, I don't know where she's now. Uh, you've got Dad Versi, who's a columnist, he works for the MCB, and he does a lot of media monitoring. And you've got Mehdi Hassan, who's famous um, for his oratory skills and his debating skills. And 0.4%, whilst we make up 4.8% of the population, so a massive disparity in terms of uh, representation. And the problem is that w without this, you, you don't get the right people to kind of push back. And the, you know, sometimes we, it's only Mehdi Hassan, sometimes you get his, his articles being posted, posted or his clips being posted. Because other than him really, like, you, you can't really find someone who's like confidently pushing back against Islamophobic narrative. Whether it's from Palestine to Israel to issues on um, Islam and Muslims in society, it's very rare to find this. And so there has to be a push by our own community to start to push people in this direction, into journalism. If, you know, no one's going to tell your story better than you. But unfortunately, we have other people telling our stories and they don't come with our best interests at heart. And the same goes with politics. So in politics, you have, out of 650 MPs, 18 are Muslims, have a Muslim name, right? 18 have a Muslim name, and 10 of them are women. And from the lords, 800 lords, and 18 of them have a Muslim name, okay? And this is where the, this is another issue where we have a lack of representation, where people who are, can be in those rooms where these discussions are being had, to put forward the Muslim perspective or the Muslim concerns and this is part of part of the issue that we don't have enough representation in these things we have a lot mashallah pushing for council seats in a lot of areas especially where there's a lot of Muslims but then to take it to the national level where the laws are being enacted where they're going to kind of be put into practice on me and you that's where the challenge has to be and that's where the challenge is so we've talked a lot about some of the issues 
We've talked a lot about some of the challenges that we face. We've talked about what the media does, what the law, where the law currently is, and we talked about a lot of the issues regarding structurally how it is that we're not represented enough in the areas that commit change or that cause change. You know, if you put a nice media narrative out there, you can change. You can change the narrative. You can change people's perspective. And same politically, but these fears we're not engaging in. So now we're looking at cures, but. What do we mean by cures? Cures is a, is a big word. I, I guess, in reality, we're looking at how you manage Islamophobia. And there's a number of things that we've, we've found that are important. One is reporting Islamophobia. Sometimes you don't know what you're facing until you can see. Especially in today's society, everything's, everything has a, stati a statistic next to it. There's a statistic, and, and if you can uh, give that data, people then can respond to it. So for a long time, people were being harassed or discriminated against because of their because they're Muslim and when they went to report it it was just reported as a hate crime but now there's a separate category within the police force that dictates that uh, that stipulates what hate crime is and so Islamophobia is a category and so now you get data how many people are calling how many people are, are, are making this uh, issue um, you got to raise awareness about the issues no one's gonna you know we make a very small percentage of this country and many people haven't you know engaged with the Muslim and so you have to raise awareness about this plight, about these issues, about this munkar that we see. Man ra'a minkum munkaran If you see an evil and know that Islamophobia is one, you've got to change it. And part of it is changing if you can't with your hand then with your tongue. You've got to speak and raise awareness. Um, creating partnerships is also an important one. Um, and uh, running campaigns and engaging with stakeholders. And we'll touch a little briefly about this. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, like, and this is where I want to kind of quickly just introduce a bit of what men does. So, so just so the, the sisters here, so you're saying that if we, because we're an immigrant community, if we had more kind of indigenous people becoming Muslim, um, this would help uh, deal with the issue. I think part, part, partly what you're saying is right. So when it comes to Islamophobia, pushing back about it, it's letting people know about Islam, let, you know, spreading the message out there and making people aware of, uh, of the deen in its reality. Um, you know, Social change has happened before. In this very country, there were shops where it would say no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Black people couldn't sit on buses. You know, there was segregation, there was all these kind of things. But social change happened. How did it happen? What did these people do to change the social dynamics? Can you name it? Do you know how they, they changed it? What did they do? Boycotted. They spoke out exactly. They protested, they did, they did a lot of these things, didn't they? There was some social action. You know, someone even did civil disobedience to kind of show the law is, is wrong. They were willing to kind of stand up. They took some hits. But social change comes in that way. No one hands you um, the justice that you want. You have to kind of take it from someone, especially when they're more powerful. Now, what is men trying to do to kind of support this? These are some of the key uh, objectives of men. Um, the first is to see a major reduction in Islamophobia. And so part of it is raising awareness, trying to uh, lobby politicians and, and, and engaging with the media to try to change the narrative. Another is to empower the Muslim community, especially when it comes to the realm of media and politics. Letting them know what it's about. What, what is, uh, how does the media work? How do you complain? How do you uh, build relationships similar with politicians? Um, securing Muslim future for our children in Britain and this is this is part of the when you you look at the spectrum of things that men does it's almost like a cradle to grave uh, organization it covers whatever aspect that the Muslim community is engaged with to try to make them confidently practice their faith from schools having halal uh, meat to uh, prayer spaces to um, all the way during the COVID to kind of push so that there's uh, you know, the, the, the burial situation is, is, is in keeping with Islamic rites and rituals and everything in between. So it's about protecting or, or securing and making sure that uh, Islam in Britain is... Uh, Muslims are able to kind of practice their faith with confidence in all aspects of their lives. And finally, to kind of show an appreciation and the reality of Islam and the contribution of Muslims. And this is part of what we're saying, that we need to go out there and engage and let people know. Because for, since the war on terror, effectively, um, from, since 9-11, 7-7, there's been this constant media narrative which says that Islam is a destructive force. When the reality, any objective person looking at Islam and its, imp and, and its impact on the world will know that it's a constructive force. Islam is a constructive force to the whole. 
So uh, why, why are the media kind of pushing a narrative against Islam and Muslims? I think there's, yeah, to be honest, I'm, I, I, I'm not, I'm not done the research. Sorry, Qari, who's that? Yeah, I, I mean, the, so the, there are people who kind of have an issue with Islam and Muslims, and, and I think this has been the case since the time of the Prophet. So the, the issue nece not necessarily is the why, although that's important. The, 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 because, what, because what it is, because it's controlled, for example, the right wing press is controlled by these you know, people who are ideologically against Islam and Muslims, ideologically, that's, that's just who they are. The challenge is to kind of make, set a metric or set a standard that everyone plays to. So when it came to, um, when it came to the media, it's about, there was a Levison inquiry, there was an attempt to try to kind of regulate them, to get them to a standard so that if they, however warped they are in their understanding of Islam, their hatred of it, the standard is we're going to hold you to this. And, but even then, that's, that's, that's still ready to kind of be enacted, but hasn't been enacted because of power. So, 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 you know, the reason why there is a hatred to Islam Muslims has been the same from the time of the Prophet. It, it, it's, all, it's always going to be there. Our challenge is to kind of see this munkar and this evil and try to rectify it. Yeah? And it's not necessary to kind of stop because it's always going to be there. But to say that we have the tools in our place and the resources, if we had the political will within us as a community to kind of step up to push back and to protect yeah? and to be proactive in engaging, then we, we, can see, uh, we can see some kind of change. But it's a case of raising the standard of literacy or the, the awareness of the community from, from the grassroots um, to, to a higher level to be able to to challenge, to push back, to to respond to media narratives. It's not one thing to kind of just tweet about it. Or, or tweeting is actually even that tiny thing is, but sharing it amongst your own echo chamber. Oh, look what they did again. You're not changing the effective change. You're not uh, holding them to account. We have to know how it is that we respond when we see Islamophobia. And what we find is that there's, there's an organization set up called the Islamophobia Response Unit. Some of you, this might be the first time you hear about it. This is specifically set up, it's a charity uh, with its own funding that is there to support Islam, uh, the Muslims who are, who, who are discriminated against. You're at work and there's discrimination, you call these up. And they will, they have connections with top uh, employment lawyers who will work pro bono for free, defending you and representing you. Uh, you have an issue in school, you have whatever it is, any form of discrimination that you feel, uh, they will give you the support. When I, I only joined them two months ago myself and in the first week a mosque got attacked in Cardiff. During the Salah, people were praying uh, Maghrib, they just finished and a guy walked by and you know, threw a brick through the window. Um, uh, they managed to catch him. But uh, they were put through to the IRU, the Islamophobia Response Unit, and they managed to kind of give them support and the press support and make the, uh, get coverage out there and make the politicians come. And, and so sort of the community kind of felt that there was some action being hap uh, happening. So the IRU is there to, to support the, uh, the Muslim community. You have to raise awareness, and this awareness comes in a variety of forms across the spectrum of uh, arenas from massage to schools, uh, uh, big events, uh, uh, political campaigning. All this is, is, is important to, to make sure that we, we, we push back against uh, the media narrative or the, the narrative that's out there. We have this Islamophobia Awareness Month, which happens every year in November. So it's happening this November, and it's going to be the 10th year this year. Some of you, for the first time, you're hearing about Islamophobia Awareness Month. And it's an event that goes across the country. Last year, there were about 500 events in councils and schools, in uh, mosques and community centers, all showing, um, and, and it's a variety of events. You have some people doing poetry events, some people doing hardline kind of like panels and discussing these issues. So it's a variety of events that happen. And uh, at least you, you get this exhibition as well. Uh, so it talks about, some of it is a bit of this PowerPoint presentation about Muslims and their contributions, about some of the statistics and things like this. Um, this is the main exhibition. These are some of the events that we hold. So some of them are big conferences where we get international speakers. Um, and we also have to engage in our local communities. So you find that the massage events like this, we have uh, involvement with women's organizations, because obviously women are the greatest victims of Islamophobia, so we, we, we give them um, programs. Uh, we do presentations for schools and uh, raise their awareness about this issue. 
uh, professional networks, some of you are perhaps working in, corporate, in the corporate sector. And you know, there are things like D&I, which is diversity and inclusion, uh, included within your companies, that you can, through that, start to engage with them and let them know about the Muslim community, the rights of what Muslims need. Um, there's a push within organizations called Muslim Friendly Employer, which is a standard that we want corporate companies to sign up to. And it will be like a mark that they have. So when a Muslim applies for this company, they know that with that mark, they're going to be uh, the, the, their religious rights are going to be protected. They've got a place to pray. They can fast. They've got you know the, the Ramadan friendly. There's halal food. There's all these kind of things. Um, university and colleges. So those of you involved in Islamic societies or student unions, we do presentations and engagements. You can work to put in memo or, or, or motions within your students' union to accept definitions of Islamophobia. And if you're working for different organizations, Muslim organizations, we can support and, and protect you as well, or assist you. We have other campaigns, so one around every election time, we do this thing called Get Out and Vote, where what we do is we actually look at, uh, we, we try to encourage the Muslim community to, or push them to get registered to vote, and then we provide literature that, what we do is we look at all the manifestos, we first look at what the Muslim community want, or demanding from their politicians, and then we look at the manifestos and we speak to the parties and we say, are you, ticking off what the Muslim community want. And then we provide that information to the Muslim community. And we say to them, here it is, this is what we've asked for, and these are where the political parties are in relation to what we need. You make your choice. You make your choice. And so then you get an informed electorate. And then what that does is, when they realize the Muslim community is organized in this sense, they want to engage, you do hosting. So this is in Scotland where you've got a cross party uh, being engaged. You do these like, hostings over here where they come and then you, you grill them and you ask them about Islam and uh, Muslim issues uh, that you care about. We have Islamophobia awareness that we talked about and that everyone can kind of get involved in. Um, this is again engaging with the professional community um, and we do other campaigns so around Palestine, uh, around uh, Muslim burial. Even recently, you know the, uh, that movie that came out about uh, Lady of Heaven, yeah, which is about the Shia community, you know, there was uh, this thing about, it came in Sino World, so there's a movie that came out that was, that was, uh, uh, um, that was about the, the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, uh, that was cursing the Sahaba and doing all these kind of things. So the Muslim community demonstrated publicly, peacefully, their democratic right. But when the media caught onto it, are oh, these draconian, these you know, uh, these 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 extremists. When a movie came out in the 1990s that people protested for, people were just like, and they won, and they managed to stop the cinema from showing it. No one said a thing. But when the Muslims do exactly the same thing, it's, there's a different spin on it. They're trying to kind of enforce their, their, their draconian uh, ways and, and, and trying to enforce uh, Sharia on us or something like that. So we step out again and we say to them, listen, whatever they're doing, it's their democratic right. Have they harmed anyone? Have they threatened anyone? No, they haven't. And so you have to kind of like almost school people again into what are the democratic rights uh, of any citizen. We have to also engage the stakeholders, and by stakeholders we mean those people with the, with the, the keys to effective change. So we were, we were sat here talking about journalists in the media, and rightly so, but not all of them are bad. And so we have to engage, we have to train, and so we do uh, journalist roundtables where we sit down with them, where we explain to them the positions of the Muslim community, some of the, 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 the language that's out there and how it harms us, and we raise their literacy and their engagement and their know-how of the Muslim community so that when they report, it's a lot more nuanced, it's a lot more, they, they, they look for, um, the, you know, they, they look at the reality of the story as opposed to just trying to grab headlines. Um, you know, this is one incident where this imam was beaten to death in Watchdale, rahimahullah. But look how it came out in the, in the times. Imam beaten to death in sex grooming town. The first automatic response is, oh, he's beaten because he was uh, one of the groomers. Nothing to do with it whatsoever. And then we lobbied and then there's an imam beaten to death in Watchdale. That's a lot more innocent, factual, and there's no one reading anything into it. The police itself, so everyone has, the police are there for everyone. And obviously people have a, a love-hate relationship sometimes with the police. But building communities and the, the relationship with the local police force is vital. You know, and I've seen, mashallah, that, you know, Isra and Maryam, they've, they've, they've done a lot of this with engagement of the wider community and getting the police involved. And this is all important so that whenever there's an issue, there's, there's open lines of communication. And of course, local councils and, 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 and MPs, they're there to actually represent you. 
But if all you do is engage politically every four years or five years, then they don't really care about you. If you're not attending surgeries, if you're not writing an email, if you're um, not uh, putting pressure on them or, or even, even commending them if they're doing something right or you know, dropping them a message, they're not going to know you or care about your concerns. The fact that you put down an email to them saying, I'm this constituent at this address, you're my MP, I have this issue, or you know, um, I'd like you to kind of address this issue, there's this law that's about to be enacted, I want you to kind of put this present, present this issue forward, or invite them to your message or to your community. They're not going to really firstly know about your concerns, and they're not going to do anything about it. But then at least if you do do that, you've got evidence that you're trying to engage, and that you're, you're, pushing, or you're pushing them to actually represent you in, in, in the right way. And so we had a video here, but uh, it's going to take a bit too long. But, uh, but effectively, it's just a kind of a, a quick roundup of exactly what it is that we've done. So some of the challenges that we face and some of the, the important things that we've, uh, we've seen. Now, how does MEN work locally? Um, across the country, we have regional or uh, community organizers like myself. So I'm responsible for Wales and uh, Midlands. It's a big patch. <laughs> but um, uh, beneath us, we have working groups, so volunteers, people who are engineers, lawyers, students, whoever they are, uh, all across the country. And so in the Midlands here, we have working groups across these areas in Wales, uh, over here as well. And anyone can kind of join uh, and engage with us. We have our Twitter page, which is quite active and has a lot of followers. Um, we have a lot of tweets that go out with press releases, call, action alerts. Sometimes we, whenever there's an issue, we throw out action alert that is very simple for you to kind of do. It's, a, it's already perhaps written email that you can send to your MP just to kind of lobby on a certain point. These are just some of our social media handles. Um, this MEND app is actually being revamped at the moment. But there's a MEND app again. This is about uh, finding out what the latest issues are. And so volunteering with MEND, and you know, if, if any of you wish to kind of volunteer, we're always open to volunteers, people who kind of care about uh, this issue and this cause. Uh, I myself, uh, like I said, I only joined two months ago, but uh, for 14 years I was working uh, in the legal industry. And so, you know, I, I gave that up to kind of do this full time because this cause is too important. Um, and, you know, no one's asking for anyone to kind of give up their day job. Volunteers come in all shapes and sizes with their own level of commitments. But it's so vital. Each one has their own skill set that perhaps an employed member of men doesn't have. Uh, their own connections, their own networks, their own something to give. And so uh, this is really a call to anyone who has the time to, to come to me, inshallah. We'll take your details and we'll see what, uh, how we can uh, work together. There's so much work to be done, so much work uh, to, that still needs to kind of be done as well. Um, that you know, We're always out for, for volunteers. You can obviously donate to MEND as well. MEND is completely community, 100% community funded. We have um, people paying their stand standing orders, um, direct debits. We have uh, uh, MEND set up also a WAKF so that it helps fund uh, its projects. I mean, when, when we are at the forefront of, of sometimes calling out politicians or media barons uh, for the Islamophobia, we're going to get hit. Um, it's just the nature of the, of the beast. Yeah? And we have taken hits, but you know, it's part and parcel of... Uh, of going out there and, and struggling against this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says Alif la meem ahasib al-nas wa yatulku wa yaqul amanna billahi hum la yuftanun do people think that they, it's enough for them to say I believe in Allah and they won't be tested and so this is part of the test you know this, we're not going to cure people from uh, having a problem with Islam and Muslims it was there with the best of generations it's going to be here now and it is now the idea is that we stand up and we be counted and we do what we can so um, if there's any questions um, or any kind of comments, feel free to make them. Um, but Jazakumullah uh, Khair from me. Um, I think there's just one quote here. It's, again, it's just the ayah that I've, I've recited um, uh, as, as a final kind of reminder to stand up, inshallah, to be able to, to kind of uh, show your faith as opposed to just declaring it, inshallah. And um, I'm here if anyone needs me. I, uh, if anyone wants to volunteer, Bismillah, Jazakumullah Khair. Uh, but with me and this presentation, Alhamdulillah, Jazakumullah Khair for paying attention. Sorry for taking longer than expected. Uh, but I appreciate your interaction and your, uh, and your engagement. Subhanakallah, Muhammadik, Ashadu Allah, Ilaha Ilaha, Anta, Astaghfiru, Katubu Ilaik, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Al-Asr, Inna, Al-Insana, Al-Fi, Khusr, Inna, Al-Dina, Amin, Wa'amin, Al-Salihat, Wa-Tawasu, Bil-Haqli, Wa-Tawasu, Bil-S